I'm just checking that it's going all right. So we're all good to go. So I um, want to say hi to everyone who watches in today um, and want to welcome Katie McMahon. So Katie um, wrote The Mistake. So I've been reading, whoops, if we can show it. I've been reading The Mistake. I just finished reading it yesterday, I think it was, and really, really loved it. I have to say it's a five out of five for me. So yeah, a really great read and everyone make sure you check it out. So K Katie, um, so just a little bit about Katie before we start. Um, Katie wrote The Mistake while attending a masterclass run by the internationally best-selling author Fiona McIntosh. And Katie has lived in London and Melbourne and is now based with her family in Hobart, Tasmania. She is a trained doctor, works as a GP, and teaches communication skills to medical students. And The Mistake is her first novel. So, as I said, what an awesome novel for your first novel. Um, also want to let people know that thanks to Echo Publishing, if you ask a question during the Facebook Live, you'll have a chance to win a copy of The Mistake. So, please type any questions you have for Katie. So, welcome Katie. Um, Thanks for having me. Just wondered if you wanted to start off by telling us a little bit about The Mistake. Yeah, sure. So um, The Mistake is a contemporary fiction novel, which is set in Hobart and Melbourne. And at its heart, it's really the story of the relationship between two sisters. One sister has this fabulous life on the surface. Uh, until her husband is accused of sexual harassment and her life begins to unravel. And the other sister is recovering from a major trauma that has ended her career and left her really feeling very unconfident about herself as a woman, um, about her body and, and with huge kind of body image issues. And it's really the story of her recovery mm -hmm. from that. And could you um, tell us a little bit about how you got the idea of the mistake? Yeah, sure. Look, it was a few things, Jackie. One, one was that these characters, these two sisters, had been in my head for years and years since I was, you know, an intern maybe, so like 20 years. Mm. And... Um, when I was an intern, I wrote this short little, I guess you could call it a novella, about one of the sisters. And then, you know, life kind of took over. But I always kind of had her in the back of my mind, oh, what happened to Beck? What happened to Beck when she grew up? And a few times I kind of started and tried to write, but um, eventually, you know, I don't know, about three or four years ago, I, I kind of had a bit more time and space in life to start writing. And I thought, look, I'm just going to try and find out what happened to Beck. Mm. And uh, and that's when this this story came out. And actually the second sister, I must say, had been a more minor character in, in that early novella. But she just kind of burst onto the page and, and took over the book in this version, in The Mistake. Mm. Mm. And I'm interested, like... You've obviously been got a career in, in the medical profession, and I'm sure you studied very, very hard for that career and that as well. How had you always wanted to be a writer, and how did you sort of fit that in with your other work? Yeah, good question. I actually um, nearly became a journalist. So mm. at, at high school, I, like I was pretty nerdy. And I really used to love doing my English homework. Like I, I would go into, you know, we had this one of those, you know, these really old computers with the green flashing cursor mm -hmm. on a black screen. And I would go up into that room where the computer was and just spend hours doing my English homework. And, um, yeah, so then after year 12, I, I like, you know, I wanted to do journalism and I got into journalism and mm -hmm. I was really stoked. 
and I took a gap year. And um, then while I was overseas, I just kind of had this turnaround and decided, oh, I really actually, I would love to do medicine. Um, so yeah, I came back to Australia and actually I had to do year 11 and 12 again. Um, Cause you know, you have to do maths and science and mm. so on to do medicine or you did then. And um, my nerdiness, you know, it stood me in good stead for doing year 11 and 12 twice. And yeah, and so then I, um, then I was fortunate enough to be able to study medicine, which I really also enjoy. <clears throat> um, but the writing thing was always just, yeah, just niggling. And mm. I really felt like if I didn't do that, I would very much regret it. Mm. Yeah. Mm. yeah. And we've got a lot of people watching, which is really great, and got some questions coming through. So just reminding people that if you do type a question, you'll have a chance to win a copy of The Mistake, thanks to Echo Publishing. Um, so Leanne says she's wondering if you have a sister and if you do what your relationship is like. Oh, yeah, thank, um, thanks for that question. No, I don't have a sister. I've got brothers. Um, so I really, I use my imagination with Kate and Beck. Mm. Yeah. And actually, as I have written in the acknowledgements in the mistake to my, my best friend of 40 years, it's 40 years this month since we met oh, wow. um, in early primary school. And as you can imagine, we've seen each other through thick and thin. Uh, and I, I couldn't have written about sisters without her. Mm. Mm. Close. I've got to assist. Yeah, no, that's great. Vivi's saying, while working as a GP, how do you dedicate time for your writing? And do you block certain parts of your day or certain days for writing? Yeah, um, I, I only work part time. I definitely mm. there's not much I do it if I work full time. So I have two to three days a week uh, where I write and during school hours. Uh, while, you know, the rest of the family's off doing other things. Mm. Uh, and, and that's literally pretty much all I do. I get very behind on the washing. I, I have to do all the washing at the weekends. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. without giving away any spoilers, um, you said before one of the characters has had a very traumatic accident. I'm just wondering, in your life as GP, had you met anyone similar with something traumatic like that had happened? Um, Kate's not based on a real person. Mm, mm. Um, and in fact, I decided, you know, very, very early on that, you know, I would never, you know, I could never utilise any anything that I saw at work, mm. you know, as the basis for any fiction, mm. even if it was completely de-identified. You know, if that person could read the book and yeah. recognise that that would be too much mm. so yeah so no um no kate's kate's not um based on any particular patient but obviously you know I, i'm lucky enough to have a, a mate i went to uni with who works works in a field relevant to kate so i was able to sort of mm. her for, for research purposes mm. <laughs> um, so that, that was great and could you tell us a bit more about what sort of research you did do for your book? Yeah, sure. I did a few things. Um, I tried to, I tried to, uh, you know, meet a model. Like I would have loved to have talked to a mm. model. This, this was one of the characters' careers. Literally, don't know any. Don't know <laughs> anyone who knows any. Uh, so you know as and as kate's career took place in the early 2000s i i ended up going to the hobart library and just asking them to dig out all their not all lots of old copies of vogue mm. i just spent a long time reading through these old you know 2002 editions of vogue or earlier which was really very interesting and brought home how much the world's changed you know like listing the stockists of, of the, the clothes with their phone numbers their landline oh, phone numbers oh. <laughs> and the social pages mm. with you know maybe 10 photos of people out on the town having a great time um which are you know obviously 
social media is just completely blown out of the water. Uh, so that was fun. And other research, uh, you know, I, I talked to an occupational therapist regarding the rehabilitation that a person like Kate might have gone through. I spent a lot of time reading about processes that are in place when, um, you know, legal processes when allegations of sexual harassment are made. Mm. Um, <clears throat> as I mentioned, I talked to my friend about uh, about that kind of medical stuff and, and I spoke to a friend who's a lawyer um, because they're, you know, it, it's, I don't think it's giving too much away to say there's a bit of a, a crimey element in this. Mm -hmm. And and so he gave me some great advice as well. Mm -hmm. No, that's good to know. Thanks. Pa Patricia's wondering how you choose the names of your characters. Oh, oh. I have a really bl a bad blind spot with names of my characters. Um, so my name's Katie mm -hmm. and other character is Kate. Like, I wasn't meaning, I didn't mean that. Uh, and in fact, my editor, when after I, you know, signed the contract to write this book, well, I have never met her or even seen her. We'd only talked on the phone and emailed. And we had this conversation and I felt like she was trying to suss out, is this Kate character based on Kate? Yeah. Like, <laughs> I look nothing like Kate. Mm -hmm. this kind of supermodel type of person um yeah no like i i definitely can have a bit of a blind spot with how i name my characters but mm. i would say i mean obviously i do what what most authors do in that i try to choose names that are appropriate for the generation of the character so you know the the older people in the book are called marion and rob because marion was obviously a more common name sort of 65 years ago than it is mm. now and kate and beck are kind of common names for women of about 40 and you know the children's names in the book are chosen because they're common names mm. now uh, and of course i try to make the names quite different from each other so i wouldn't have two characters names starting with b or you know Okay. Yeah. Mm. Or it gets too confusing for readers. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Um, Vivi says she knows you're a tea drinker. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and she wonders what your favourite tea is. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> um, well, my favourite tea bag is, which I know is not very, um, you know, fancy, but is Dilma. Okay. Or Arling's <laughs> English breakfast. Mm. Um, which is a treat, like to buy a whole box of twinings, right? It's more expensive, way more expensive than Lipton's. Um, but yeah, so Dilma's my regular, twinings, English breakfast tea bags. And then I really, you know, for more fancier leaf tea, uh, I really like, um, what is it? T2, T2 Melbourne breakfast. Oh, like, okay. like I, I quite like that for when I'm going for leaf tea. Yeah. But I'm not much of a herbal tea fan, I have to mm. say. I always drink my tea with caffeine. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Geraldine wonders, how much do you plot your story or do you just let it flow naturally? Um, I let it flow naturally up to its own. You know, when I started, I didn't know how it was going to end. <clears throat> um, so I would say from that point of view, I'm very character driven in that I let the characters, I try to let the characters kind of unfurl the story. But obviously there comes a point where you have to kind of finish the book and bring it to a climax and tie off the loose ends. So uh, at that point, I start to think more about plot mm -hmm. and i'm interested to know like this is your first novel how long did it take you to write it and had you written any other manuscripts before that you uh, you did mention about your novella but were there any that you wrote that you just found weren't quite right or um no i i mean i wrote a, a couple of short stories i did um well, to answer your first question, I would say it took me about two years 
two and a half maybe mm. um, to to write this um <clears throat> yeah maybe actually maybe even up to three including the sort of editing process uh i'd written a couple of short stories so before i i did so in the introduction you said that you know i wrote this during the fiona mcintosh mm. class which which i know is the information provided but you know that master class went for a week so i didn't I didn't you didn't write it in a week. <laughs> yeah, no, it felt funny that. I couldn't sort of crack out, you know, 10 chapters or five chapters a night or whatever it was. Um, but before I did that masterclass, I started a master's of creative writing. Mm, okay. And, um, I wrote some short stories for mm. that and, you know, essays and stuff for that, which, which were very helpful, actually. Mm. You know, one of the writing is writing exercises I did during that became the basis for one of the scenes of the mistake. Mm, okay. And when you were writing the mistake, did you have a friend or family that you showed it to as you were writing? No, I actually didn't. I was very uh, kind of private about it, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, I showed one friend the first few pages when I was quite some way into it. And very, very late in the piece, when it was pretty much done, I showed my husband. Uh, yeah, but, but no, I didn't. No. I wasn't part of a writer's group. I yeah. wasn't working on chapters mm. or anything like that. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Belinda's wondering if you're working on something new. Yes, I am. I'm working on a second book, um, which... Some days I feel like it's going all right, and other days I just feel like, oh my goodness, what am I doing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And is it similar genre? And yeah, so it's it's similar genre. It's mm. not a sequel, um, so it's different characters, but it's also set in Hobart, mm. and it is it, it's 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 working title is called The Accident, and it is looking at um, you know a, a road accident. And then looking at all the elements and following the characters and what brought them to be at this time and place. Mm. Yeah. And was it really an accident? Is mm. any accident really an accident? Yeah, no, that sounds interesting. So are you only just at the beginning of writing that? Uh, no, I've been into that for about, like since, you know, as soon as the mistake was sort of put to bed, which was... I guess around September mm. last year, although it was only published March this year. Um, I've, I've been working on that. Yeah. Mm. Obviously around, you know, you're combining it with um, promoting the mistake and, 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 you know, the rest of life. Mm. Mm. Um, Geraldine's wondering what genres and authors you like to read. And I'm wondering if maybe there is something you've been reading lately that you want to recommend to us. Sure. Um, <clears throat> Genre-wise, I don't actually really have a genre that I particularly like to read. And, um, you know, Michael Rowbotham or says, you know, the amazing Australian crime writer says, oh, you should mm. read outside your genre once a year. I'm always like, oh, maybe that's why I don't really know what my genre is because I read all these different no, genres. A, yeah. But mm. at the moment, um, the the last thing I read was, which was a reread, was The Accidental Tourist by Anne Tyler. So it's a really old mm. book, um, as you probably all know. And it's just so, she's just so good. It was wonderful to read that. I also um, recently really enjoyed the book Wonder, which is mainly a children's book and was made into a film. And I just—I was making one of my kids' beds one morning and it was lying on the bed and I thought, I'll just, you know, read a page and see what they're reading. Mm -hmm. um, and I ended up sitting down on the bed for like, you know, 50 minutes. I just, like, I couldn't put it down. It, 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 it's really very lovely story. Uh, also just started um, a book set in Tasmania. I've got an advanced copy of it. It's called The Last of the Apple Blossom by Mary Lou Stevens. And that is quite close to home 
it's it's the, the, the first day takes place in the 1967 bushfires which oh, okay. the yeah. event in Tassie um, and I think she very beautifully evokes mm. what the experience must have been like for people in Hobart mm. yeah, so they're three that I'm reading at the moment yeah thanks for those recommendations Alison has said what was it like the first time you walked into a shop and saw your book on the shelf Yeah, I'm, I'm looking for the word. I work with words. I'm so great with words. Great vocabulary. Look, to be honest, I just felt really self-conscious uh, because the bookshop is one that I go into all the time. Mm. And um, I felt like, oh, I don't want them to think that I'm, you know, overly proud of myself. I just want to act casual. <laughs> so I was just trying to act really casual. <laughs> yeah. Um, but... At one point, one of my friends was at, at either, I think Melbourne, it was at Melbourne, she was at Melbourne Airport and and my book was at, you know, it was prominently displayed mm. in the airport bookshop and she took a photo of that and, you know, texted it to me. And that was a very important moment because I remember being at Sydney Airport probably five or ten years ago and looking at the the fiction titles on the shelves at Sydney airport and just thinking, oh, I'd love to have my book. Yeah. Mm. So that was a really special, even though I wasn't there in person. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and as a first time um, published author, how do you feel about reviews? Were you uh, looking at them or? I, I generally don't look at them. Um, I find that I find it by far the hardest thing to be mm. honest, like writing the book and, you know, waiting to find out if you're going to get it published and, and all that was, you know, like I'm not saying that was easy, but a but hundred times harder is seeing how one's book is received. Mm. <clears throat> I don't know, you know, I haven't had like heaps of bad reviews or anything. <laughs> mm. um, yeah, you know, I, I, I generally don't read them, but of course yeah. some, somehow things slip into your consciousness mm -hmm. yeah. and could you tell us how hard or easy it was for you to get the mistake published um i have to say i was very lucky and i had a dream run yeah yep so uh it was picked up by the first publisher publisher i picked pitched it to oh, so right. um we worked great together you know it was a dream run yeah yeah, yeah. sounds like you were very lucky i was very very lucky mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. yeah so i'm you know deeply appreciative of Tegan morrison at echo mm -hmm. yes. no and that's it was, great it was, it was such a fun moment when I, I got this text i'd just um dropped something off at a friend's house and you know, i'd sort of hidden it in her garden for her because she wasn't home i thought oh, i better just text her and tell her where i've, where I've left this thing um yeah and there was a text saying hi my name's tegan and i've just read your manuscript and blah blah, blah. <laughs> and i was like ah! <laughs> quickly drive time and started you know frantically trying to make it better <laughs> <laughs> and could you tell us um did you when you were writing did you have someone who really encouraged your writing um yeah a few people so mainly my husband mm. uh he was just great i kind of like said yeah i'd love to write a book he just said oh well you should do it mm. like why wouldn't you why couldn't you of course you can i'll help you yeah go go for it <laughs> my father really encouraged so uh that's how i came to do the fiona mcintosh masterclass. okay so for people who might not know that's like a I think it's five or six days it was in adelaide when i did it in 2018. Mm. um <clears throat> excuse me and there's about 12 or so um, aspiring writers in the group and yeah and so my dad gave me that class for Christmas present. Oh, okay that's great. Yeah. Mm. Um, you know mom encourages everything I do basically. Mm. Just mm. Things like be fantastic no matter <laughs> <laughs> no, <that's... laughs> what. Yeah. Yeah, yeah great to have such support. Oh yeah. 
Anne's wondering if you had a break between the mistake and then starting on your new book. Ah, uh, no, not really. Sort of a short one. Mm. Uh, like I'm talking, you know, days to weeks rather than weeks to months. Mm. But in the beginning of, of the second book, I was kind of still doing bits for the mistake. So it was still, there was still, you know, last revisions and stuff to make. Um, yeah, but no, I didn't have a long period mm. when I wasn't doing anything. Mm. Mm. And Geraldine's wondering if you feel more pressure now writing your second book. Yes. Yeah. Mm. Mm. One thing, <clears throat> um, I've got someone in mind, you know, I've got like all my editor in mind. Um, and, you know, yeah. So no, are you, like, were you signed for another book with Echo? Um, yes, yeah, so I've got a, I have yeah. got a contract for a second yeah. book. Yeah. yeah. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, so, you know, there's deadline and mm. blah, blah. Yeah. So definitely it's, it's more pressure. Mm. Mm. And, and could you tell us what do you hope readers will love about the mistake? Uh, I really hope that people will take away from it ideas about how women, you know, as women we can relate to our bodies and how our body image can be so kind of, how, you know, how that can affect us so yeah. much depending on what our body image is. Mm -hmm. And that they might take away a little bit of social commentary about, you know, some of the things that go on in society and, 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 and some ideas around that. And I guess really that they might love the characters. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And could you tell us for you, what do you think makes a good story? Oh, wow. Yeah, I should know this. This should just be like <laughs> down pat. Oh, look, I mean, I think for me, what I love in a good story is that it, that it feels real mm. and also that I care about the characters. Yeah. Um, like, to be honest, no matter how well written something is, if I don't care about the characters, I sort of, you know, like I, I might persist reading it, but, I, you know, I really love it when I can be made to care about the characters. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, I love a bit of an ambivalent ending, like, um, you, you know, there's a book, well, everyone would know about it probably, um, Three Wishes by Leanne Moriarty. Yeah. And um, the ending of that book, it's kind of bittersweet, which I really loved. And uh, ditto her book, um, The Hypnotist Love Story. You, you know, it, it doesn't necessarily, everyone doesn't get it. Get it. Yeah. It's kind of an optimistic ending, but it's not all mm. sort of signed, sealed and delivered. Mm. No, yeah. that's untrue. Yeah. So before we finish off, just um, reminding people, if you do have any questions before we finish, please type them in comments and you'll have a chance to win a copy of The Mistake. While we wait to see if there are any more questions, can you tell people how they can keep in touch with you? Yep. So, um, yes, join me on Insta because I just like got into Instagram very short time ago mm. and, and I need some more followers. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, you know, I'm on Insta, um, at Katie McMahon author and Facebook, did I, Katie McMahon author. So yeah, so that's lovely. Yeah, it's always really nice to, to hear from readers mm -hmm. that way. Mm. Yeah. And do you find you usually respond to people if they reach out to them? Yeah, like, yeah, definitely. Yeah. 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 No, that's good to hear. And Mary wonders, do you have any writing peers that you share experiences with? Writing peers? Yep. Um, yeah. So I mentioned before my, my friend Tanya Farrelly, who's just released her first book, The Eighth Wonder with Penguin. Um, so she and I text a bit mm. and 
another friend, Annie Robson, who has written a lovely book called Addressed, which she self-published. Um, you know, we chat. Uh, and, and Sarah Clutton, who has written a few books. She writes in the sort of domestic thriller genre. Okay. Um, mm. Yeah, so Good Little Liars, uh, The Daughter's Promise, and, and, and um, which, are, which are fabulous, and set in Tasmania, mm. we keep touch a lot. Yeah, Sarah mm. Clutton. Mm. Yeah. And I'm just wondering, like, with bringing your book out during when it has been a bit different with COVID, I mean, it might be a little bit different in Tasmania, maybe in some other places, but without not being able to travel to states to do um, promotions and that, how have you found that? Yeah, um, I mean, it's a bit, it can be a bit disappointing, can't yeah. it? We had a lovely event all organised at Melbourne. It was fully booked. The mm. bookshop were all, you know, we were all keen for it. Um, I was very excited about it and, we, you know, we had to cancel it because of Melbourne lockdown. Mm. But, I mean, that's life, right? There's there's so many worse things that could yeah. be happening than not being able to promote your book. Mm. Uh, and, you know, I think we're all getting pretty used to Zoom, aren't we? Mm. Yeah. And have you been able to do some in-person things in Tasmania? Yeah, I have. So I've done a couple of in-person things in Tassie. And actually mm. I did get, it was a while back, to go up to Queensland um, and do something there, which was fantastic. Yeah, really great. that's great, yeah. Yeah, yeah so mm. it has been good. Yeah. No, and it's great that we can talk to you on Zoom as well. Yeah, mm. yeah no, it is. It's great. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for joining us. Um, as I said at the start, I really, really loved the mistake and was five out of five for me. So really excited to be reading any more books that you have out. Thank you. Thanks, Jackie. Thanks and, so much. <laughs> and um, yeah, hope we might have you again in the group. Perfect. I'd love to. Mm. And thanks for everyone who joined in and the questions that we had. Yeah, thanks so much. Thanks. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.